Hello everyone, welcome to session two of LTech 620. This week we're going to cover four topics. First, I want to review the results of the session one survey. Then we'll talk a little bit about what we've learned related to human perception. Then I want to talk about the importance of the principles of design. And then we'll close out by talking about a couple of different image types. So let's get started. In total, 20 of you took the session one survey. Now, the first question asked if you consider yourself a visual designer. And as you can see here, the class is kind of split. Seven people, or 35%, agreed, and four of you strongly agreed that you consider yourself a visual designer. Another eight, or 45% of you, said neutral or disagree. The second question asked if you enjoy the process of making a design look just right. Here we see an overwhelming majority, 90% of you, strongly agreed or agreed. However, we did have one person answer neutral and one person strongly disagree. In terms of experience using Figma, the results were somewhat mixed. 12 of you, or 55%, said neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. In contrast, 7 or 25% of you agreed and one person strongly agreed. Now the next question asks whether or not you're familiar with another graphics editing program. Here the class is all over the place with four people answering for every possible answer choice. When asked if you have experience with Loom, an important part of this class, 13 or 65% of you answered agree or strongly agree. But on the other hand, seven or 35% answered neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree. And finally, the survey asked whether or not you know the difference between raster-based and vector-based graphics. And here we can see a large contingent of you, actually 13 or 65% of you, answer neutral, disagree, or strongly disagree, whereas 35% of you agreed or strongly agreed. I think it's important to review these results because we have a class of 20 people. So rest assured that there are other students in this class with a similar level of experience as you. So if you're new to visual design or Loom or Figma, don't worry, you're not alone. And if you have some experience in these areas, there are other classmates who can help you learn and grow too. In short, we'll make it work for everyone. Okay, now I want to pivot to talk a little bit about this week's readings. And let's start with the Johnson piece and this idea that human perception is biased. Now, Johnson does a really nice job of arguing that human perception is biased due to our past, our present, and our future. In other words, our goals. And wonderfully, most of you touched upon these ideas in your analyses for Critical Reflection 1. Of course, Johnson was talking about these biases because there are implications for design. And he summarized these implications into three kinds of takeaways that are important for us to remember as we move forward in this class. The first takeaway is this idea of avoiding ambiguity. And as an example of that, I captured Madeline's picture of the ACF shower gel product. I think this is an interesting example because the bottle is see-through, which allows the user, the potential buyer, to actually see the product, see the flower, see the color, the consistency, and how the product moves around in the bottle. And that is a very good idea when you want to avoid ambiguity. It's kind of like the designers are saying, hey, Look at how beautiful and natural our product is. Another implication for design covered in the Johnson piece is being consistent. And Dalen pointed out the consistency that Tylenol uses in the branding of its products. He pointed out that all of those boxes have the same red color and the same white font and more or less the same shading. Over time, Tylenol be becomes very recognizable and really jumps off the shelf. And the point is, from a design perspective, is that that consistency allows users to spot and recognize that brand very quickly and with minimal effort. The third takeaway for design is to understand the goals of the users. Now, I captured this example from Josh's Drugstore Cowboy assignment, where he had this vitamin product by Ollie. The label prominently says, Hello, Happy in a way that I suspect connects to the possible goals of someone browsing for vitamins. The implication is by taking these vitamins, you will be healthier and therefore happier. 
I hope you're seeing the connections between what we read about in the Johnson article and the drugstore cowboy assignment. Now, the where reading takes a bit of a different tack. This reading took us down to the physiological level and presents a theory of vision that describes what makes something easy for humans to see. The article talks about this concept of feature level contrast, and there's plenty of examples of feature level contrast that are based on empirical research studies. Ultimately, the takeaway for us is that if we want to make something easy to find or easy to understand as designers, then we have to make it different from its surroundings. And the way we do that is by using one of the primary visual channels. For example, we might give the design a color that's substantially different from something else. Or we might make it curved if everything else is straight. Or we might make something blink or move if everything else is static. Where helps us recognize that the reason those things are easy to see is because the hardware of the human visual system is designed to work that way. Some of the fun, of course, of the Where's Waldo series is that it purposely violates this idea that things are easy to see. So by not making things very different, in other words, purposefully avoiding feature level contrast, it creates this engaging game where it's a challenge to look for Waldo amongst all the other busyness of the surrounding scene. Now, I also want to talk about the importance of the idea that perception is both bottom up and top down. There was an interesting study by Alvar Jarvis many years ago, and basically what happened is Jarvis and colleagues used an early form of eye tracking and asked participants to look at this famous painting. Importantly, they gave the subjects different instructions or scenarios. So in the scenario shown on the left, they wanted the individuals to examine the painting freely. And on the scenario on the right, they asked the participants to assess the age of the characters. So the experimenters actually track the eye movements of the participants depending on their instructions. So take a look here on the left. These are the eye movements of a single subject asked to examine the painting freely. By following these white lines, you can see what the individual looked at. Now, this is an example of bottom-up processing, where the design of the painting itself, in other words, the physical stimuli of the painting, actually drove or influenced what the subject was looking at in the painting. Now, in contrast, here on the right, we see the eye movements of a single subject asked to assess the age of the characters. Now, in this case, we have top-down processing because the user came to the experience with the explicit goal of assessing the age of the characters. Notice the difference in the eye-tracking movements between the two scenarios. Even though it's the same painting, the same visual stimuli, the end result of what was looked at and for how long was quite a bit different. I like this example because I think it really illustrates how human perception is both bottom-up and top-down. Now, I want to share with you one other fascinating study that is related to visual perception. This study is by Osgood and colleagues, and it's, it's from the early 1950s. And essentially, the research question was what descriptive terms do naive subjects use most frequently to evaluate visual stimuli? In other words, when you show somebody something that they've never seen before, how do they evaluate that thing or that stimulus? To answer this question, they asked people what they thought was the most important. And these were some of the sample descriptors that they let the participants in the study think about. So for example, do you want to know if this thing, this visual stimulus is pleasant or unpleasant? Is it repeated or varied? Is it smooth or rough, large or small, beautiful or ugly, low or high? In other words, at the end of the day, what matters when somebody is seeing something for the first time? Now, the results of this study are absolutely fascinating. They found out that when humans evaluate something they've never encountered before, they quickly decide on three factors. The first factor they called evaluation. In other words, is this thing good or bad? The next thing that humans evaluated was potency. Is this thing weak or strong? And then thirdly, they talked about the activity of the thing. Is this thing passive or aggressive? Now, you could think about these results from an evolutionary point of view. If you're out living in the wild somewhere and you see something that you've never seen before, 
the first thing that you want to know is, does it look good or bad? Is it weak or strong? And is it passive or aggressive? And of course, having the ability to evaluate something quickly and accurately would increase humans' chances of survival. You might be wondering to yourself, why in the world is Dan talking about evolutionary psychology in the context of visual design? Well, I want to make the connection of evaluation, potency, and activity to visual design and its impact. So here, for example, you can see some posters from an anti-smoking campaign. These visual designs, of course, are designed on purpose to make you uneasy. They're designed with intention and they're meant to tell you that smoking is bad, smoking is strong, and it is aggressive. Take a look at the second one from the right, the one with the lines. I don't know if you can see it here, but the text in the circle says cigarettes, colon, just looking at them makes you sick. And of course, the lines we have in this poster creates this kind of visceral wavy feel to them. The idea is to make the viewer uneasy and uncomfortable when looking at the poster. Okay, so where are we going with all of this? Well, as we said last week, we're hanging out at the intersection of visual design and visual literacy. So our path forward is to learn about the principles of design. Principles such as layout, alignment, hierarchy, proximity, balance, repetition, so on and so forth. Importantly, we have to know how to use those principles. And Williams, in his book, The Non-Designer's Design Book, argues that good design involves three things. Number one, learning the principles of good design, which we're going to study the rest of the summer. And two, recognize when those principles of good design are not being used. And three, actually apply those principles of design. And so we're going to be learning about those principles, recognizing when they're not being used, and then importantly, applying them to our own designs. Now, to close things out, I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about the difference between bitmap and vector graphics. Now, bitmap and raster are two words that are often used interchangeably. So let's talk a little bit about bitmap graphics. You can think of bitmap graphics as, as a really large grid of squares, and images can be created by putting different colors in each of those squares in the grid. And when viewed from a distance, all of those individual squares blend together to create a photographic image. So here's a really simplistic example. The first image on the left shows an empty grid, and then the middle graphic shows that colors populate the squares of that grid. And then if you zoom out far enough, you can see it becomes a very detailed photographic image. Now, the advantages of bitmap graphics or raster graphics is that they can be created with a digital camera, a scanner, or a paint program. Another advantage is that they have subtle tones of gradations. So you can have a lot of detail and it can be very subtle and smooth and sharp. Also, bitmap graphics can have transparent backgrounds if you use the right format, such as PNG, or Portable Network Graphic. Some of the disadvantages of bitmap graphics is this idea that bitmap graphics can't be enlarged without distorting or resulting in jagged edges. So take a look at the word raster here. And if we try to enlarge the E in that word, you can see that the E becomes fuzzy. It has jagged edges. It's not clean and crisp. That's the primary disadvantage of bitmap graphics. You can make bitmap graphics smaller, you just can't make them larger. And another disadvantage is the file size for bitmap graphics can be quite large. Now, let's contrast bitmap graphics with vector graphics. A vector graphic is one in which the shape of a line is defined by a mathematical expression. That mathematical expression contains the instructions that tell the software how to draw the points, lines, and paths of the image. So here's a, an example. You can see there are three blue dots. Those are points. And then there's a red line. That red line can be defined through a mathematical formula. Now the advantage of vector graphics is that they're scalable. And the image, when you scale it up, will maintain its quality. It won't have any distortion or jagged edges. So if you look here at the E in vector, you can see that it blows up without any loss of quality. 
Also, because vector graphics deal with mathematical expressions, the file size is usually much, much smaller. Finally, vector graphics can also have transparent backgrounds, and they're ideal for work that needs to be displayed in really big or really small sizes. And a classic example of this is fonts. One of the reasons why we can have very tiny 10 or 11 point font as well as a much larger 48, 64, or even 100 point font is because most fonts used on computers today are vector graphics. Now, some of the disadvantages of vector graphics is that they often require special software to create and edit the graphics or the images. In addition, usually vector graphics require a little bit more skill to create. And the selection of stock artwork that's out there in vector graphic format is much smaller compared to all of the bitmap graphics that are available in stock libraries. Now, I wanted to share all of that with you because I think it's important that you recognize that visual design often combines bitmap and vector graphics. To show you an example, I screen captured a couple of front pages of magazines. So here on the left, you see Muse Magazine which is a science and art magazine for kids. And you can see clearly there is a combination of both bitmap and vector graphics. Similarly, on the right, the National Geographic Channel had a show called Mars. And you could imagine how that particular design is a combination of bitmap and vector graphics. Now, importantly, Figma is primarily a vector editing program, but it can, through plugins, accommodate bitmap graphics as well something we will get more into in the next few weeks. Finally, take a look at this image from the software Affinity Designer by Serif, the company. They have a nice example here of an image that's vector only and then one that's vector and bitmap or vector and raster. So if you look at the image on the left, you can see the trees and everything are very smooth and the monument and of course the, the skull there. But if we look at the right, we could see a lot more texture in the grass, in the trees, in the skull monument, and the tower in the background. And so that's the additional level of detail that bitmap and raster graphics can add to vector graphics. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for this week. Have a great week, and I'll see you in Canvas.